From the Columbia University Language Resource Center, this is Said and Done, the podcast about languages and the people who speak them. This is Said and Done. I'm Chris Kaiser, and joining me today is Professor Melissa Marcus, known to her friends, family, and students as Penny. I joined her in her office at Yale to speak with her about her life and work, and in particular, her participation in two major world historical events from her early life that I've always wanted to ask her about. Here's my conversation with Melissa Marcus. Professor Melissa Marcus, it's a real honor for me to be able to have this conversation with you. You're a professor of Italian at Yale University. You've published six books now, as well as countless articles. You're a mentor and guide for generations of graduate and undergraduate students. I should also mention that you were my PhD thesis advisor, so this is a particularly enjoyable homecoming experience for me as I visit your office at Yale. So, Penny, thank you for agreeing to speak with me today. Thank you so much. It's very emotional for me and very meaningful, and I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you back home, <laughs> and, um, and I'm looking forward to our conversation because I think it's going to clarify a lot of things to me just simply in our dialogue. Great. Well, there's a lot that we could talk about. And, you know, I was your PhD student for many years, uh, and we also worked together in Italy in the Yale Study Abroad program. So I have a good sense of many of the things that you've done in your scholarly life. But also in this time, you've alluded somewhat mysteriously to two events in your life that I'd like to learn more about in this conversation. But to start, I'd like to ask you a question. and, And this is the question that I ask all the guests who are on this podcast Can you talk a little bit about the environment in which you grew up, where you grew up, and I know you're a professor of Italian and that you speak Italian perfectly, so can you talk talk a little bit about how you came to know Italian as well? I grew up in Baltimore. I'm um, at the beginning of the post-war baby boom, and I think I was very much formed by that, by the generation I'm part of. My father came back from um, the European theater he uh, he lost his brother in World War II. I was named after his brother. He was Milton Marcus. If I had been a boy, I would have been Milton. Um, and so I'm Millicent, but with the nickname, unlikely nickname of Penny. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for using that name. I really appreciate that. My mother was a culture vulture. And my father was a much more, he became a businessman. And, uh, but she raised the family with a, really a love of culture and actually a love of, of foreign culture. Um, and my interest in cinema actually began uh, as a teenager when we went to art cinemas together. And I saw Fellini's Eight and a Half, for example. Um, they took me to see Bicycle Thief by De Sica, and I was profoundly moved. I was profoundly puzzled by eight and a half. But we also saw French films, I remember last year in Maribad, and again, being intrigued and um, and just really drawn to these films for a reason I didn't quite understand. I drew up, it grew up in what we called the Golden Ghetto, to, um, a Jewish enclave of uh, young people who were very because of our generation, we were encouraged to um, go to wonderful colleges and encouraged to take languages, for example. Um, and so I, I took Latin and French. Um, but then when I got to college, my French teachers were scary. I remember we had, <laughs> uh, we in those days we went to classes. Um, six days a week, and our Saturday class at 8.30, I remember the French teacher would come in, whom I, I later met later in life, and she wasn't scary, but then she was. She would come in smoking her galois and drinking um, an espresso then, and, and she, was, she was terrifying. She wore stiletto heels, and um, anyway, and I didn't do well in French. <laughs> um, and so I thought, I'm not a, a person gifted in, in foreign languages. Uh, but then uh, uh, friends of mine at Syracuse University um, 
were going on the Florence program, and I, I wanted to get away from Cornell. It was I felt that Cornell was a pressure cooker, and I needed to get some distance. And so I, on a whim, asked my parents if they would send me also to Florence, and and they said yes. <laughs> um, and in Florence, I felt strangely immediately at home, and I felt that. Interestingly, since I didn't know much about my Russian Jewish heritage, uh, we had lost track of those relatives. For me, suddenly Italy became a surrogate home. And I felt that, or maybe I had been Italian in an earlier life, but it was very uncanny, that feeling of familiarity and, and an immediate connection. What about it made you feel that way? Was there anything in particular, or was it just a general feeling? I lived with an, a remarkable family. We had family stays on the Syracuse program. And um, I felt right away connected with them. There was nothing stereotypical about them. The father was a painter um, who had come from southern Italy, and he was, he was very quiet, very inward. And the mother turned out to be a Yugoslavian Jewess who had been saved by her husband oh, and wow. given refuge by her husband in Italy. And might, that might have been some sort of subterranean, subliminal um, connection that I had. I, I don't know, but I felt so wonderfully, wonderfully at home and welcome in this very quiet way. I fell in love with Florence and uh, medieval culture, um, painting, um, the, the humanistic strain in that culture. And it, it just changed my life. And I became fluent within three months. Really? Wow. Was it living with his family? Was it the friends that you acquired? Were you uh, living with a lot of Americans? Or were you mostly in an Italian world while you were living there? So... These are great questions. Um, first of all, at the age of 20, um, I did not have the child sort of open synapses, you know, that you have before puberty. But I had this amazing openness to this new world. But I was also taking classes. So I was, uh, I was learning the grammar in class in very sort of traditional modes. But I was getting those structures down. And at the same time, I was living an Italian life and just through my senses, through the foods, the rhythms of the life itself. It seemed to me that the culture was somehow encoded in every single way linguistically. All the cues I was getting from my environment and, and almost sort of the urban design, all of this was linguistically encoded for me. And so I was just getting it through all my senses, through, so cognitively, experientially, every single way. And I've still had enough open synapses, I think, at the age of 20s. Right, yeah. One of those windows that we yeah, are still open. Sure. And yeah. uh, all these things came together for me. So I want to talk a little bit more about your time there, and we'll delve into some specific events. But first, I'm interested to know, you, you then became a graduate student in Italian and later a professor of Italian. Um, so as you were wrapping up your undergraduate time, how did you know that you wanted to continue with Italian? What was your thought process there? When I came back to Cornell, there was no Italian major, but there was a Dante course. And I remember, because I had been so immersed in this Florentine world, and I remember loving the art history and all, um, all the kinds of stimuli that I was getting, and then I remember, and so uh, it was Professor John Frichero, who was already legendary. And he was just amazingly charismatic and compelling as, as a teacher. And I remember the first, so we did it, we were reading the text in Italian, although the classes were in English. And I remember the first time I sort of looked at Primo Canto, of Inferno and, you know, sort of the words were swimming around in front of me and they came together and they made sense. Wow. And I could read that text. Yeah, yeah. 
And to me, that was just this total revelation. It was an epiphany. And he was, he connected, the way he taught Dante, he connected it in, um, to the way one experiences life narratives in ways that meant something to me and my own life's narrative. I mean, I was no mezzo, I was not no mezzo del camino. I was, again, 20 years old. It's unusual, in my opinion, for a 20-year-old to be thinking a lot about life narratives. I, I think when I was 20, I was not so reflective. I didn't have an overarching narrative of my life. Um, so what, what caused you to think in this way? Well, because of the way Fruchero framed, uh, framed the teaching um, and notions of autobiography and how you need that, or what he called Archimedean point outside time to look at the shape of your life. Um, and Dante as himself bearing witness to a truth. And it was a truth that could be expressed in literature. And not only that, but his text was a conversionary text. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, for me, as a Jew who had fallen in love with Italy and not with Catholicism as a faith that I myself um, could internalize, but as a reference point for finding truth and finding it in art and th through then hum humanistic discourses. And I think if there's going to be a through line here, it's going to be impegno. So Im impegno is a kind of hard word to translate. In the classes that I've taken with you in our conversations, we've talked about this concept. I think to some extent it might mean engagement, political engagement, commitment as well. So how would you describe the concept of impegno, which is, I think you're saying it's, a, it's an ethical posture in a certain type of, of Italian literature? Yes, and ultimately film. And uh, engagement, yes, which is um, a way of taking art as something that can somehow, through interpretation, through our own work of opening up meaning, can then convey humanistic values of the way in which then we communicate with others profoundly, care for others, and can act in the world. The relationship between reading literature and, and viewing film and the way in which we act in the world, I know this is a theme, or as you would say, a through line of much of your scholarly work. Um, but it is also a theme, I would say, of some of the things that, that you've done in your life. And in particular, there are two events that you've told me about just, just in passing, where I was like, whoa, really? And these were events at which you were present and which you participated. Um, these were the, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963 where Martin Luther King Jr. famously delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And the second was the flood of the Arno River in Florence in 1966, where you participated as one of the Angeli del Fango, one of the angels of the mud, that is one of the people who helped to rescue books and works of art and paintings, uh, manuscripts that were damaged in the flood. So I want to talk about both of these and, and really get your recollections of these events, uh, starting with the March on Washington. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to be there and, and what your memories are of that event? Again, I owe so much to my parents in terms of this upbringing. They were always activists in the Democratic Party. And so then growing up in the 1960s, and I'm very much a child of the 60s, we, we were involved in something as teenagers in something called the Baltimore Tutorial Project. And this project involved sending us to the inner city of Baltimore and, and, and tutoring children who, who needed sort of this kind of remedial help. And so uh, I remember I, I tutored several young children. And when the March on Washington was being planned for August 28th, 1963. I was about to be 17. And the Baltimore Tutorial Project 
organized a bus to go to this, to the march. And my parents, who were, on the one hand, very involved in civil rights and uh, very much supporting civil rights, they weren't activists in that the movement per se. They were worried about sending their daughter. They were worried about Ku Klux Klan violence taking place. And so they decided to send me with my younger brother, who was this big, burly <laughs> younger brother, um, and who was just a year and a half younger than I. And, and so sort of begrudgingly, they said, okay, you can go. And so I remember being on this little rickety, it was a really small school bus, and approaching then uh, the, the mall area between then, it was the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument, and there was the reflecting pool in between. And as we approached, we didn't know what to expect. We had no idea about the numbers or whatever. And as we approached it, the whole area was covered with people. I burst into tears. It was so incredibly emotional. And on, and I found out later that among those people we saw, there was just like a mound of, of uh, as a grassy knoll, we could call it. There were Peter, Paul, and Mary, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, you know, all of the, you know, the folk singers of the time. I found that out later. And what I remember, and when you're in the midst of something historical, you don't know you're in the midst of it. Right. You, you, you yeah. have no point, you know, Archimedean point to step back. But I remember um, we got close to the Lincoln Memorial where the speeches were taking place. And we saw the shady area. We were under some trees. It was very hot. And I do remember the people sitting around the reflecting pool with their feet in the water. And I do remember there was a sense that it was a huge picnic. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of that this was such a festive, joyous moment that no one expected, you know, the numbers of people and the atmosphere. It was it was joyous. And so we heard a series of speeches. Around what time did you get there and get settled? Um, when did the speeches start? And and was it a nice day? Was it a how was the weather? How was the weather on that day too? It was a, a beautiful, hot day. Okay. It was a sunny day. I don't remember timing. It it was, you know, it was a blur. It was, there were, there were a lot of just impressions, yeah. sensations, and impressions. And we heard the I Have a Dream speech. But it was, you know, only in retrospect that I realized I was there for that. What was it like to hear it live? I didn't know I was hearing the I Have a Dream. All I know is I was present there. My brother might remember more. I mean, I was so overwhelmed with emotion. And a feeling of euphoria of exaltation and and the sense that my parents fears there were no clan people that we saw there were there was no anxiety about it it was just this great wonderful gathering tell me about the way back home after everything ended what were people saying again you know i can't i don't have precise memories of that i i don't it, it was so much in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's so often the case if we think about, you know, things that we didn't know right. were so historically important were so, somehow turning points. Well, I think to a certain extent that moment, you know, even the I Have a Dream speech is, is only ever taken in a short clip of it. You never hear the whole thing. So when did you start to think this is one of those crucial turning points in American history? I suppose as Martin Luther King be became himself more and more prominent um, up until his assassination in 1968, mm. yeah. But that for me, you know, marked the beginning of my awareness of the civil rights, civil rights as a movement, as a mass movement. Do you feel that your awareness of the civil rights movement and your 
proximity to it helped to give you this sense of empeño, of political commitment, commitment to justice, or, or did your commitment precede that? It preceded, um, but it was it was so sort of amateur and you know <laughs> episodic. And this way, I think there was a sense of and and the power of street protests of actually being and so and that soon morphed into anti-war mm-hmm. anti-war um, activism and <laughs> I used to joke that I, I never met a protest march that I, I didn't join I mean you know uh, the idea of being out on the streets in in numbers did you attend a lot of anti-war protests all of them <laughs> All of them, and in fact, when I was at, at Yale, you know, we all we all came down. I remember in groups uh, for the the march in Washington, the march in New York. There was the Stokel, Stokely Carmichael, where he said to Lyndon Johnson, "It's too bad your father didn't pull out in time." I mean, it was just, you know, uh, but all of that, um, and so you know, I I was in every march that I could possibly. Be in. So, what was it like then to go from this very heady time, this this turbulent time too in the United States, and then to be kind of transported to Italy so suddenly? Was it a, a sudden and jarring change, or or didn't or did it not play out that way for you? So, let's see. That was nineteen sixty six when I went to. Um, so sixty three was was the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. And and then just three years later and in between was, you know, my time leaving home, going to college it, itself. Um, and then right away in 66, the anti-war movement heating up. Right. So were you doing more protests before your time in Italy or, or after your time? So before and after, okay, I so guess, I guess you know, it was a sort of a pause in that, obviously being in Italy. And, and again, it was, I needed to get away. I mean, I think Italy was very important for me. However, from what you've told me, you had a different kind of impegno when you were in Italy. And I'm really curious to talk about that. So just as kind of retrospectively, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom has become this crucial defining historical moment in the life, in the public life of the United States. So too, when you were in Florence, there was an event that happened, a disaster really, that has become a defining moment in Italian national life. So can you talk about what was that event and and what you did during that time? Yes. So I was um, in Florence at the time of the flood, November 4th, 1966. And uh, I was living with a family, and we were in Via San Nicolo, which is uh, Oltre Arno, the other side of the Arno, in a point that's pretty low, you know, topographically speaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Arno, there was a lot of rain in those days, and apparently what we heard later was that there was a dam up river. Um, and that at a certain point, an engineer working the dam realized that it was becoming dangerously you know, full, the, the water up, up river, and that he decided to open just a little bit to relieve the pressure. Mm-hmm. But at that point, then, he wasn't able to close it again because the electricity was obviously disrupted. And later on, he committed suicide, apparently. But anyway, so this tidal wave of water came down. And um, in the middle of that night, I remember having a dream about someone knocking on our door. And it turned out it was not a dream. When I woke up at 7 in the morning, friends of the family I was living with, a friend who was living on the Ponte Vecchio, people all the people living on the Ponte Vecchio were evacuated, and she came to our apartment for shelter. Um, wow. But anyway, at 7 in the morning, we looked out our window, and there was the Arno in the street. Oh, wow. It was in the street. Mm-hmm. 
And all that day, of course, we were cut off from, we had a transistor radio. And the transistor radio was reporting um, sort of, you know, sort of nonchalantly every now and then in between music or whatever. Uh, oh, the, the Arno is flooding in, in, in Florence, but, you know, in a very casual way. Again, when, in fact, it was not a casual event. It was a kind of a big deal. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a deluge. You know, it was the flood, and um, we were up on the terzo piano, the third so floor. so we were on the third floor, and so you know we watched the waters rise, but without a sense of panic. You know, it was just strangely calm, mm. and uh, finally at midnight, before they had gotten up to our level it began to subside. And so this was, a, this was a Friday, and it was a national holiday. It was the holiday for the victory, World War I Victory Day. And this was a good thing because it meant that people weren't at work. People hadn't been out on the streets. And so this was one reason why the mortality rate was relatively low. Yeah, People were sleeping in, yeah. And so the next day, Saturday, of course, we were marooned. Um, and actually, I remember a boat came down the street <laughs> oh, wow. with um, like milk, you know, and and bread and and some water. And people would lower down their baskets from their windows. Mm -hmm. By the time it got to us, it was, the boat was empty. But it was really for people with small children, you know, people who really... And we were okay. Uh, we had canned food, and we were able to. We were fine. Um, and then on that Sunday, the water had subsided. But what was there in the streets was something called melma, which was a kind of mud. But the, the worst thing was that there was an oil slick on top because at the beginning of November. The nafta, the heating oil, really for the poor, had already been put into people's, stored in people's cellars. And that was just this really disgusting, filthy petroleum product. Right. Yeah. And that's what caused the most damage. Mm -hmm. And that's what left the marks. Yeah. Um, that you can still see, you know, there are markers on the buildings where the height of the water is... Um, so this mud, this melma, could you walk in it? How high was it? Was it going up to your knees? It was going. It was going up to the calves, and wow. luckily, I had the, the, the fashion then in 1966 was high boots. <laughs> but luckily, they they weren't you know leather or what. They were plastic, <laughs> so I was equipped to be able to walk out. And I remember walking out. And we went down, uh, I went in Centro, and I saw the, the baptistry and what were the bronze doors of, of Ghiberti, and several of the panels were gone, had been washed away oh, wow. by the flood. So they just detached and washed away? They were washed away. And I do remember also, and this was just shocking to me, women tourists came, actually, you know, from other cities, in their elegant clothes to see the damage. Yeah. And it was <laughs> so you saw the aftermath, and I, I know that you participated with a group of young people who were working to save books, who were working to save manuscripts and, and books and works of art. So can you can you talk about that? We were all students from the Syracuse program, and um, most of the students were evacuated into... Um, a, a hotel actually up above and, um, Poggio and Pediale in that, in that area on the other side of the Arno. I refused to leave the family. I said, they need me, and I'm going to stay, and I want to help. Um, and, and so some of us were able to do that. Um, but again, I refused because I felt so connected. I wasn't family. going to leave them. Yeah. 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 And... So the American students who were there, because we weren't, you know, we weren't residents and we didn't have to help our, our families 
dig out of the stores. You know, the stores are all on the on the first floor. And I remember was I as I was walking through the city, whole families had to basically what they did was had to remove all of their merchandise and whatever into the streets so that they could try to clean off things and begin begin the work of of cleaning up. And one of the things I noticed about the Florentines is they they never stopped in a paralysis of shock and horror. It had a paralysis set in. The the cleanup would really not have progressed at all. But no, they right away pitched in. But because we students were free of that, um, we could then work to help to whatever do whatever we could do. And so um, we were, many of us worked in the um, Biblioteca Comunale, where the most precious manuscripts and books had been stored underground, wow. and it was right next to the Arno. So we formed like um, lines, handing to each other these manuscripts. Uh, and I remember, you know, looking at them, and you know, these gorgeous, you could tell, beautiful covers, covered with Melma and Nafta. And, and just, you know, heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, we also worked in um, in Santa Croce within the, the actual church itself of Santa Croce, helping to sweep away them. And, you know, many of the, um, many of the tombs were in, in the ground, you yeah. know, in, in the floor. Right, right. And those tombs had to be opened up and aired out. But, you know, we did the first things, which was helping just to sweep them off. Right. Um, and so we were called the Angels of the Mud, the Angeli del Fango. Uh, and when I, every time I've returned to Florence and said I was an Angelo del Fango, you know, there would, there would, gratitude was expressed yeah, to yeah. us. The Angeli del Fango, was it mostly Italian students? Was it American students too? Uh, who were the people you were working with? I was most aware of the American students, but we know um, that the, the Italian students, um, you know, were pouring in. Students from from Europe were all, and and um, the film La Meglio Gioventù by Giordana um, shows uh, again a, a Italian students who, for whom, this was a kind of touchstone in terms of their own impegno. So saving, saving these literary manuscripts yeah. and 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 the works of art, you know, whatever, and and the monuments themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so it was a kind of youth. You know, it became. It drew, youth activism, and again, you know, we're talking, 1966, and this is you know, we're talking, the run up to 68. But the 68, we can call it the long 68. Right. But that, and so the impenio, uh, and again, the feeling that we as young people, the post war, the first post war generation, should do something. We had to act. So in the 60s, you had these different types of personal impenio, personal engagement, and also one area in which you've become most known for in your scholarly engagement with Italian film is films centered around questions of impegno. So can you talk about how your impegno, your appreciation for justice and political commitment sort of translated itself into your study and scholarship on film? Yes, and it started out really with neorealism and uh, again, which is all about World War II and, and here, you know, my father and, and my father's involvement in um, in World War II and, you know, what the American military was able to do to help save the world, or certainly the Western world, from Hitler and Nazism. And, uh, and so, so I became very interested then in films about World War II and the immediate post-war period, mm -hmm. and Italy's... Um, attempt at rebirth 
and um, and I became interested in what it meant to be, uh, you know, in a country that had been occupied by the Nazis, and so uh, these films, which are where Rossellini and the neorealist movement itself, it's a movement about bringing about um, an awakening and the desire through the power of the medium to move people and to create communities and um, to instill what I call social desire, um, the power of, of particularly a cinema to do that um, and to bring about an awareness of social injustice and the need to act. And so you have Rome Open City, which is about the resistance movement. Um, and then you have Bicycle Thief, which is about the injustice that followed from the sort of latent sort of conservatism and the failure, really, of Italy to come to terms with its past, the fascist past, and, and to bring about the kinds of social reforms that need to be needed to be enacted. And so this has been the through line then. I've always been interested in the cinema d'impegno mm -hmm. in Italy and the various forms that it's taken uh, over time up through now the beginning of the 21st century. And your scholarly work has reflected that? And your teaching has also reflected that? Well, Professor Melissa Marcus, Penny, Thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. This has been wonderful. And you've, your questions have really helped me think through what that the themes really are and the various forms that the Impenio has taken. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.